This is a video walking you through how to answer an exam question about the second A-level chemistry required practical in which you measure an enthalpy change. This particular question is about measuring an enthalpy of solution, which is probably what you did for your practical endorsement. Before I describe how to answer this method question, pause the video and have a go at answering it yourself. Remember, this is going to be a six mark question, so it should be taking you about six minutes. And also it's going to be level response marked. So you probably want to include more detail. You don't just want six bullet points. You want to talk about equipment and why you would be doing certain steps as well. The enthalpy change required practical is pretty broad. So you could be asked about any chemical reaction, even one you've never done or seen, or you could be asked about a physical process like the enthalpy change of solution that we have here. But the overall principles are going to be the same. You're going to be trying to work out how much energy has been either released or absorbed. You're going to need a number of moles of either the limiting reactant, if it's a chemical reaction, or of the substance that's being dissolved, if it's an enthalpy of solution, like in this question. And you're going to want to discuss things like how to minimise the energy losses to the surroundings. The first thing we need to do is to accurately establish the volume of water we have and the mass of copper sulfate. Now, the precise volume and mass are not important as long as they're reasonable. You're not going to have a kilogram of copper sulfate in one centimetre cubed of water. But we do need to specify which equipment we're using in order to measure this. So to begin with, I'm going to measure out 50 centimetres cubed of water using either a burette or a volumetric pipette. I'm not going to use a measuring cylinder because the uncertainty on that would be just too high. And having measured out that water, I'm going to transfer it to some kind of insulated vessel, probably a polystyrene cup, preferably with a lid. Then I'm going to measure out my copper sulfate. And again, the exact mass doesn't matter. But if you've done this practical, you'll know that you use about four grams of it. And what is important is that we measure that out using a high precision balance or a balance that can measure to two decimal places. So once I've got that measured out, I'm going to start taking the temperature of the water using an accurate thermometer that can measure to the nearest 0.1 degree C. And I'm going to do that every minute for four minutes. And I'm doing this in order to establish an accurate initial temperature. So what you don't want is a situation where the water is coming out of the tap cold at 17 degrees, but your room temperature is 25. So actually the water is coming up to temperature just on its own without any kind of other process happening and you're not accurately recording what's actually going on there. So once we've done that for four minutes and we've got those readings of what the temperature is doing then we're ready to add the copper sulfate. So that's what's happening on minute five and so you're not actually going to record a temperature on minute five. What you're going to do is work out what that temperature is by extrapolating back your line of best fit from your other data once you've completed this. You're also not going to rinse out your weighing boat because if you did that, you'd be adding more water that you hadn't taken account of um, and the whole thing would just mess with your results. So we're definitely doing the weighing before, weighing after method here. So we're then going to reweigh the weighing boat to establish the accurate mass of copper sulfate that was actually transferred, not just the mass that you put into the weighing boat in the first place. So we're taking account of any residue that's left over. Then we're going to replace the lid on the insulated vessel and stir it to homogenise that solution. And then we're going to continue to record the temperature at minute intervals up to about 15 minutes. Um, I think when this has come up in the past, they've said something like a minimum of eight further recordings. So doing it up to 15 minutes is more than enough and it's just a nice, easy number to remember. So once you have all of those temperature recordings, we're going to make a graph and we're going to plot temperature on the y axis against time on the x axis. And you're going to end up with your initial readings where you just had your water with nothing in it. And then a separate set of readings um, where the, after you'd added it and made a solution. And so therefore you're going to have two lines of best fit and you're going to extrapolate them so that they both hit that five minute point so that you're able to determine what the temperature change is. Now that I have that value for delta T, I can do this analysis. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work out an overall energy change for the process. So I'm going to use Q equals MC delta T. So that's going to be the mass of the water multiplied by the specific heat capacity, which is 4.18, multiplied by the change in temperature, which is whatever I've worked it out to be from um, the difference between those two lines of best fit where they hit the five minutes. 
Then to work out a value of delta H, I'm going to need to take that value of Q, of the energy change, and convert it to kilojoules, because it will be in joules at that point, so I divide it by 1,000. And then I'm going to need to divide it by the moles of copper sulfate that have been added. So then, of course, to work out the moles of copper sulfate added, I do whatever that accurate mass that I actually transferred was. So here I've said 4.00 grams ish because that's what I was aiming for. But I might have had some residue, so it might be slightly less divided by the MR. And of course, I'm going to need to work out what the relative formula mass is in order to do that. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you're now slightly more confident in asking questions about this second required practical of AQA A-level chemistry. If you have found this video useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.